which were the inhabitants of West Africa. First, we'll start off with identifying some Euro myths involved in the terminology of this land. America. The term America, according to U.S. history, was supposedly taken from the Italian navigator Amerigo Vespucci. The truth is, the term is a two-part word, Amer, taken from the French word Moor, which were the inhabitants of West Africa, Morocco, and Mali. These Africans were also referred to as Mer, Moor, or Morenos in Spain to mean black. The term Moor is the root word of the Latin term Amor, or the French word Amor, or the Italian term Amore, which means beloved, and was the term used in reference to the Moroccan kings who sailed via Spain and became religious leaders of the Vatican. The original Vatican priesthood was African. Catholic equals cat holistic or holy cat of Egyptian symbolism symbolized by the Sphinx. The Moroccan priesthood oversaw the papal government. The term When mankind came to what is now the region of the Great Lakes, it was perhaps as long as 13,000 years ago. Near the end of what we call the last ice age, glaciers a mile high were receding to the far north. As they moved, those glaciers crushed giant rocks into gravel and sand and carved out enormous holes that filled with melting water from the glaciers. Those glaciers made Lake Huron and the rest of the Great Lakes. But as the glaciers melted, plants and birds and animals moved in. So did humans. Those groups of humans are known collectively by several different names. Indians, Aboriginal peoples, and Native peoples. Traditional Indian stories tell of a creator of all things who placed the native peoples on their homelands. There are many scientific theories on how native people first arrived in North America. Many scientists think the native peoples came to North America by walking from Asia. Today, there is deep water separating Russia and Alaska. On a map, you'll see it's called the Bering Strait. But more than 13,000 years ago, evidence indicates that there may have been a land bridge there, connecting the two continents. According to native peoples and their oral history, they have been here since time immemorial. These first groups of people in North America are often called Paleo-Indians, which means Indians from the old time. We don't know much about them. We don't know what kinds of clothes they wore, what their houses looked like, how their families worked, or their religious or spiritual traditions. Mostly, we have to make scientific guesses about those things. But we are certain of one thing. They had to be very strong people to survive the difficult times after the Ice Age. Most of what we know today about these people is based on evidence from stone tools modified by people and bits of bone. Spear points were among the first tools of the Paleo-Indians and can be found across North America. Some of them have been found near St. Clair County at what scientists call the Holcomb site, named after the person who discovered it. Spear points were an important hunting tool for Paleo-Indians. We also know that in these early days after the Ice Age, giant mammals roamed the land. For example, mastodons, which looked like elephants with heavy fur and huge tusks, 
lived in what is now St. Clair County. We don't know for sure, but scientists believe it's likely that the Paleo-Indians hunted mastodons because they could provide large amounts of fresh meat, as well as fur for clothing and bones that could be turned into tools. Over time, the climate got warmer, and the glaciers kept melting. If our winters today seem cold, you should have seen what they were like 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago is hard to imagine. Let's pretend that every inch on this scale represents 1,000 years. If you and I are living at this end, representing today, and the other end of the scale represents 12,000 years ago, around the time when glaciers had just disappeared, it's still hard to picture how long that is, isn't it? Well, let's imagine that you live to be a very old person of 100 years old. 100 years is one-tenth of an inch on this scale, and a child who's 10 years old would only be one-tenth of that one-tenth of an inch. But what seems like a long time for you and me is only a blink of an eye for the world. The world is always changing, but it changes very, very slowly. As we return to the Michigan of about 10,000 years ago, we see that as the climate was changing, plants and animals were changing too. The mastodons and other giant mammals disappeared. We're not sure why they disappeared. We do know that the native peoples adapted to the changes. They used technology to help them deal with their changing world. Today, we think of technology as computers and televisions and video games. But in the old times, technology meant new tools to make hunting easier. The invention of this simple device, which today we oftentimes call an atlatl or spear thrower, made hunters of that time much, much more dangerous to their quarry. It simply acts as a lever extending the reach and therefore the power of your arm. Just as in the same way you can hit a baseball farther with a little practice with a bat rather than throwing a baseball. It's essentially the same idea. With the atlatl, they were more successful hunters and their tribes were better able to survive. Scientists today have theories about what day-to-day -day life would have been like for native peoples in North America thousands of years ago. Spear points and animal bones are strong evidence of how these people hunted. Traditions handed down through the generations provide indirect evidence that the ancestors of today's native peoples developed many skills to help them survive. Among these traditional skills is that of using natural fibers to make baskets, ropes, and even fishing nets. Techniques developed over large spans of time continue today. Scientists believe it is likely that during the old times, native peoples were relatively few in number and lived in small groups. During this time, St. Clair County and the rest of Michigan was covered mostly by pine forests. Scientists know that not a lot of other plants could grow in such dense, cold pine forests. That meant there wasn't a lot of food in those forests for either people or animals, so they would have to move around a lot, which is easier for small groups and a lot harder for large groups. It also seems likely that if native populations were larger, we would find more evidence of them. But there may be another reason evidence is scarce. We know that the lake levels were much lower in those years than they are today. It is possible that many rich archaeological sites, which would give us even more information about life in those days, are now hidden beneath the waters of Lake Huron and Lake St. Clair. Many net sinkers, stone weights used to hold fishing nets in place in the water, have been found in the St. Clair River. These hand-shaped stones are clear evidence that fish were an important source of food for native peoples in the region. Increasingly, hardwood trees were growing where only pine trees grew before. Many of these hardwood trees grew nuts that people could eat. 
Animals as well as humans enjoyed the new richness the forests provided. This meant more wild game for the hunters. Migratory waterfowl such as ducks and geese, along with frogs, turtles and crayfish found in wetlands also added to the diet. Such a rich bounty of food may well have allowed people to have larger families because it was easy to find food. By moving their campsites within different ecosystems in the region, native peoples could provide for all in their family, group, or tribe without having to travel long distances to hunt big game. An even greater change about 2,500 years ago marked the beginning of what we now call the woodland period. Until this time, it is likely that everything that native peoples ate was either hunted or gathered from the wild. But now, at the start of the woodland period, there is evidence that people began to grow some of their own food. This is an important change because it meant people could now settle in a smaller area with their crops providing them the food they needed. Native people still moved often to allow the land and animals to replenish themselves by moving around the allowed habitats to regenerate. About this same time, we see that native peoples were now using another form of technology. This technology was in the form of pots made from clay. Pottery is easily decorated in many different ways. Scientists find pottery particularly important to study because often the different decorations and designs on pottery relate to how ancient peoples lived. Many mysteries remain about how these early native peoples lived. One of the most interesting mysteries could be called the mystery of the mounds. Most of the mounds were burial mounds, but some likely were the foundations for buildings. Possibly, temples of some sort were built on top of them. The mystery is, no one knows who these mound builders were, why they built mounds, or why they stopped building them. We know that mounds existed in St. Clair County, including mounds in Draper Park, in what is now the city of Port Huron. Unfortunately, farming and building construction through the years have destroyed these mounds in any hope of learning more from the evidence they contained. It may well be that the mystery of the mounds will never be solved. Somewhat less mysterious is another part of Native history that is located about 50 miles to the north of Port Huron in Sanilac County. This is the home of a series of detailed pictures carved into rock. These are called petroglyphs, and scientists believe they were carved about 1,000 years ago. The reason that there are so many glyphs and so many symbols on this one particular stone is that for hundreds of years people have been putting down not only animals that they were hunting or things that were in the particular area but also we think many people believe um, that there was a spiritual side to it as well the Sanilac petroglyphs are important because of the stories they tell about life in those days. But they are even more important to native peoples today who consider them to be sacred connections to their ancestors. Throughout their long history, life for Michigan's native peoples was one of hard work, courage, and spirituality. The traditions of native peoples living today tell us that their ancestors believed in keeping good spiritual relationship with the world around them. The native peoples here had a reverence for all living things. You know, we believed each blade of grass and each tree, each animal had a spirit. And we, we honored those spirits by both, by uh, even when we hunted, we, we would, you know, give sema and we would say a prayer for the spirits of those animals and letting them know that we were coming to, to take some of you. For the original people, one of the areas they settled was in Michigan. Today, these people are known as the Anishinaabe, a group of tribes known today by the names of Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. The largest group of native peoples living in Michigan and St. Clair County were known as the Astaron, or People of the Fire. They called themselves by names that referred to their clan or village. Often, they simply called themselves the people or the original people. Those
Those names again reflect the ancient stories that tell of a creator putting each group of native peoples in their individual homelands. By the middle of the 1600s, an event happened that would mean life for St. Clair County's native peoples would never again be the same.